Thank you. Thank you all. <clears throat> Let's move on to our next speaker. That is René Ford. Um, René Ford is a postdoctoral fellow at Aarhus University in Denmark. As part of the European Research Council, um, she participates in a project called um, Heart Openings, Cultivation and Experience of Love in Religious Traditions, Islam, Buddhism and Christianity. Currently, her work focuses on gathering life stories and interviews that share Tibetan and Nepali Buddhist experiences of heart openings. Um, René also teaches Asian religions as a part-time lecturer at the University of North Carolina. Um, overall, her research focuses on the interplay between Tantra and Dzogchen in the heart essence, vast essence, um, so the long chin ning tik literature of Nyingma lineages. She has also translated a few texts from English to Tibetan, including the third Dudupchen's staircase that leads to the Lotus Light, essential instructions on Guru Yoga. And her talk today is entitled Space as Canvas, Heart Openings, the Experience and Cultivation of Love in Religious Traditions. Thank you, Rene. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Julia, for that nice introduction. Uh, I think there was just one little small change in my title. Uh, the title of this paper is actually Space is Canvas, the Relationship Between Space and Creativity for Longchenpa. Longchen Rapchen Drime Utze, or Longchenpa, a 14th century Dzogchen Nyingma master from South Tibet, synthesized the entirety of the teachings throughout his writings found in his Seven Treasures, the Fourfold Heart Essences collections, the Trilogy series, along with other texts found in his collected works. His Seven Treasures, including the Treasury of Basic Space, the Chuying Zhe, the Treasury of Philosophical Systems, the Juptat Zhe, and the Treasury of the Natural State, the Neluk Zhe, synthesize teachings from the 17 Tantras of Dzogchen, Sakya Lamdre, and Dzogchen philosophy. While the seven treasures are thought to have been primarily composed when Longchenpa was in retreat at Kangri Tuka in central Tibet, the composition of the fourfold heart essences, the Ningte Pyashi, is attributed to Longchenpa's meditative realizations and encounters in visions and dreams with beings such as Yeshe Sogyal and a 16 year old woman who confirmed that Longchenpa would receive the heart essence teachings. The juxtaposition between Longchenpa's seven treasures, heart essence teachings, and his scholastic education paired with meditative practice illuminates how we might understand the relationship between space and creativity. The Dzogchen ontological and epistemological frameworks in the juxtaposition of Longchenpa's writings and his biography demonstrate how reality is wisdom's expressions in infinite forms through cultivating space. As we will come to understand that Dzogchen cannot be contrived, therefore is not achieved through effort, I stress that Longchenpa's visions and capacity to compose his writings are also not created through effort, but through a resting in space, just as Dzogchen ultimately instructs. Tukul Tunda Rinpoche writes in his introduction to the English translation of the commentary on the treasury of basic space that, quote, Chuying Zhe is not a composition contrived by a conceptual mind, but a manifestation of Dharmakaya in the form of naturally arisen words creating for Longchenpa and Dzogchen is uncontrived, resting in space that allows for infinite possibilities to arise. I turn to Longchenpa's descriptions of the relationship between space and creativity in his root text, Treasury of Basic Space, and his commentary on this root text, A Treasure Trove of Scriptural Transmission, Chu Ying Rinpoche Zogi Drelba Lungi Terzu. I focus on how Longchenpa describes reality itself to be spacious, dimensional, and wisdom, yeshe in Tibetan, to emphasize that perhaps a fundamental epistemological default is a creative and spacious matrix, thereby showing that space is creativity and supports creative processes. Then I turn to excerpts of Longchenpa's biography that highlight how it illustrates the relationship 
between creativity and space and his capacity to receive and elucidate the heart essence teachings, the chondroningtic in particular. Uh, next slide, please. Dzogchen describes that reality has dimensions. Three crucial dimensions are Ngoo, Rongshen, and Tukje, translated as essence, nature, and all pervasive compassion, respectively. They're also summarized as, quote, essence being empty of inherent existence, nature being spontaneous presence or luminous, but cell, and capacity being all pervasive compassion. The all created majesty, regarded as an early prominent Dzogchen text, extends Ngoo, Rongshen, and Tukje to correspond with the view in the three kayas. Quote, the sphere of nature itself is called the Dharma body. The sphere of essence, which includes the five elements, is called the complete enjoyment body. And the sphere of all pervasive compassion manifesting as wisdom is viewed as a sphere of Nirmanakaya. These three kayas or bodies correspond with the essence, nature, and capacity dimensions, which are not separate from one another. Longchenpa opens his treasury of basic space with, I pay homage to Samantabhadra. I pay homage to naturally spontaneous, excellent and wondrous phenomena, self-arising wisdom, luminous, enlightened mind, universe of appearances and possibilities, a treasury where cyclic existence and liberation arise, not strain and free from fabrications. This homage illuminates how Longchenpa understands that Samantabhadra is a representation of reality itself and that he expresses reality as being a wholeness with dimensions as described above, spontaneous, wisdom, luminous, and bodhicitta or enlightened mind. Samtan Karme disp distills how Samantabhadra is the Dharmakaya and his the great perfection. The primordial basis possesses three specific qualities. Its state is pure from the beginning and has a physical form. Its nature is spontaneous and is luminous. Its self-being is the primeval intellect, which pervades all. This is Chugu, the transcendental aspect of the Sem, and is given the name of Kuntu Zongpo. Samantabhadra is reality and the three Kayas. Paying homage to Samantabhadra is also paying homage to the qualities of Samantabhadra that are the qualities of reality itself. Longchenpa and Dzogchen are pointing out the various dimensions that appear as reality. Reality is understood as a matrix. And it is within this reality that there are qualities of spaciousness. As these three bodies or aspects of reality are not separate from one another, they are also all suffused with wisdom. There is no boundary between wisdom, mind, and phenomena. Rather, all of reality and the way it ultimately exists is also wisdom. Wisdom then is marked by these three aspects of emptiness, spontaneous presence, and all pervasive compassion. Now we may understand that wisdom mind is understood to be unbounded and complete, since it is zok, space that is unbounded capacity, spontaneous presence and compassion. Uh, next slide. Reality as unbounded spaciousness, spontaneous presence and compassion also incorporates ordinary mind and thought. Longchamba explains in his treasury of philosophical systems that it, basic space or chewing, serves as a ground from which both samsara and nirvana emerge. He goes on to quote Saraha's song of realization, a song of the treasury of realization. Mind itself alone is the seed of everything. Everything in conditioned existence and nirvana unfolds from it. Homage to the mind, which is like a wish-fulfilling gem that grants the fruitions of one's desires. Ordinary mind is not separate from other than reality and wisdom mind. Further investigation of Longchenpa's treasury of philosophical systems leads us to see how he describes the unfolding of ordinary mind and suffering and how suffering occurs from ordinary mind because this type of mind perceives duly. The liberation of ordinary mind and the recognition of wisdom is merely the recognition of the non-dual empty nature, luminous, all pervasive, compassionate wisdom that is the ground of everything. Longchenpa also explains in his treasury trove of scriptural transmission that mind itself abides as awakened mind, naturally occurring and utterly lucid, timeless awareness or wisdom that never changes. Here, Longchenpa points out to how realizing awakened mind or timeless awareness is not beyond mind itself, 
and demonstrates that the path in accessing these qualities that are already present within mind. Hong Trimbo addresses this relationship between space and all appearances and commenting on his root verse of the treasury of basic space. Mind itself is a vast expanse, the realm of unchanging space. Its indeterminate display is the expanse of the magical expression of its responsiveness. Everything is the adornment of basic space and nothing else. Outwardly and inwardly, things proliferating and resolving are the dynamic energy of awakened mind. Because this is nothing whatsoever yet arises as anything at all, it is a marvelous and magical expression, amazing and superb. Longchamba offers commentary on this as he explains, in the space-like context of one's self-knowing awareness, this display of myriad phenomena, this animate and inanimate universe that seems to endure, is revealed to be amazing and superb since it arises timelessly as a continuous magical expression within an unborn state. Treasure Trove of Scriptural Transmission, Longchamba's auto-commentary, offers a variation on the homage. Homage to all the vast hosts of victorious ones. I pay homage to the original protector, Samantabhadra, flawless and totally pure like space, the deity of the kayas and timeless awareness, which do not come together or separate, separate, the glory of both conditioned existence and the peace of nirvana. For all beings in samsara, which is like an illusion, clearly apparent without truly existing, bound by their reifying perceptions as though in a dream, the ultimate meaning of great perfection is that they are by nature totally free. I will give a detailed explanation of the supremely spacious state of spontaneous equalness. Next slide, please. Samantabhadra is compared to unstained pure space right away, highlighting that even though there are appearances that are interpreted as suffering or liberation, depending upon the mind that perceives them, all of this is occurring in a scene that is empty of anything whatsoever. Longchimba concludes his intention to explain Samantabhadra with pointing out that all these dimensions are situated within, quote, the supremely spacious state of spontaneous equalness, or as I might translate this line, aspects of the great undifferentiated vastness. We can apply these commentaries of Samantabhadra and his embodiment of space to all enlightened forms. Seeing any enlightened form may provoke Longchamba or other Dzogchen, even tantric practitioners, to rest in a spacious state. Additionally, creating these forms may also allow the artist to recognize a spacious quality as they work. A constant recognition or familiarization through the creative process may further propel the creative process, severing reification of the artwork. The section has focused on how space and appearances are not conceived as separate, and that Samantabhadra is an embodiment of all these elements. Now I turn to a few metaphors that Longchamba uses in his treasure trove of scriptural transmission to highlight how Longchamba expresses spaciousness in understanding ultimate reality. Space is also used as a metaphor for awakened mind in Longchamba's treasure trove. Space is a metaphor for awakened mind. Since that mind has no cause and is not an object that comes into being, it does not abide in any finite way, is inexpressible, and transcends the realm of the imagination. The phrase, the realm of space, is simply a way of illustrating it metaphorically. Even in the metaphor itself cannot be described as some thing. How could the underlying meaning that it illustrates be imagined or described? It should be understood as a metaphor for what is naturally pure. A space metaphor is used, Longchamba says, because it represents that there are no conceptual boundaries within which a weakened mind or wisdom can be explained. We can also apply the space metaphor to ordinary mind, since nothing is beyond wisdom. Longchamba also quotes the perfect dynamic energy of the lion. The enlightened intent of Buddhahood is a state of equalness free of substance. Naturally manifest timeless awareness is dharmakaya, pure like space. Awareness free of elaboration is equal to space. With no reification of sense objects which are empty, conduct is free in its own place. Here, there's an emphasis that awareness, when it is free from elaboration or chu, sometimes also translates as fabrications, has complete freedom. This freedom occurs because the mind is not a reifying, a subject and an object that causes duality and therefore suffering. 
The space metaphor draws our attention to wisdom's ability to completely and infinitely open. The third and final metaphor I draw our attention to is a quote from the all creating majesty or Kunche Gelpo. All phenomena are the nature of space. There is no nature of space. There is not even a metaphor for space. There is not even a measure of space. The ultimate meaning of all phenomena without exception should be understood in this way. The emphasis here is now on the objective side of ultimate reality, but objective in quotes, pointing out that all appearances or phenomena are space. They are no more reified or outside of the empty nature of Dharmakaya. Perhaps familiarizing with phenomena as the nature of space gives further cre creative potential when producing art, texts, or songs of realization. Rather than having a sense that one must produce duly, one is able to create freely without a sense of creator and created. So far, I highlight how space and appearances relate philosophically in Longchenpa's writings, which represent Dzogchen's ontological and thereby epistemological frameworks. Now I turn to a selection of Longchenpa's biography that also frame the interplay between space and creativity in a biographical context, but for an example of how these components might play out together. Chapter eight, uh, titled Tamra Revelations and Miraculous Events and Jampa Mackenzie Stewart's The Omniscient Dharma King of the Vast Expanse, summarizes how Longchenpa received the Khandru Ningtik. The three main pieces I wish to stress are that the Longchenpa first open mental space through med meditation, two discovers teachings, and three witnesses a multitude of appearances. This is a quote. That night he knew the meditative clarity of resting in the state of the expanse of primordial purity, the Dharmakaya. The Sambhogakaya arose as a manifest expression of power, and the Nirmanakaya and the six realms of samsaric existence arose separately as its outer radiance. It was then that he discovered the innermost esoteric Khandru Yangtik. Yeshe Sogyal stayed there for six days, giving instructions and mind, mandate transmissions of the signs and symbols, meanings and examples of the Khandru Yangtik, and entrusting these to Longchamba. Because of this, many of the objects of meditations, ways of introductions, and unique ways of instructions, all of which were previously unknown and had never been explained in written texts, spontaneously poured forth from Longchenpa's mind. Longchenpa's experience not only highlights the philosophical frameworks described earlier in this paper, but also demonstrates how resting in space through meditation and resting allows for this creative moment that opens him to receive the teachings. Emically, Longchenpa is recognized as a Buddhist master who settles into the natural spontaneous wisdom and rests in that state. Questioning Longchenpa's level of realization is beyond the scope of this paper, but I do suggest that since Dzogchen explains that our ordinary minds are not outside of the capacity of Longchenpa's minds, that Longchenpa, Longchenpa's capacity to rest in the three kayas is not beyond any other mind to do the same. On a more mundane level, we can understand that Longchenpa's capacity to rest in a meditative state allowed for him to receive, co-create, and understand such teachings from Yeshe Tsogyal. The space gave room for the creative process to unfold from the space of Longchamba's mind and for Longchamba to understand what he was receiving. Also, Longchamba necessarily perceives or conceptually knows that seeing Yeshe Sogyal or other enlightened beings was no different than interacting with Samantabhadra. Earlier, I pointed out that Samantabhadra is the embodiment of the three kayas and its three aspects. Paying homage to Samantabhadra is in some ways the same as seeing Yeshe Sogyal. Either Longchenpa conceived of them as empty, luminous, and all-pervasive compassion, or engaged with them in an enlightened state, meaning in a non-dual, non-reifying manner. Familiarizing with these embodiments of realizations also provoked Longchenpa to produce large bodies of work. Even in the narrative, we hear that Longchenpa did not know these instructions prior to writing them. The text suggests that there is a spontaneity occurring for Longchenpa, and the only way for this to occur is from space. So to conclude, Longchenpa's elucidation of the nature of reality embodied as Samantabhadra and his explanation of the various dimensions of spaciousness, spontaneous presence, and all pervasive compassion that is suffused with wisdom provide a framework from which we may explore the relationship between space and creativity. For Longchenpa, space and infinite creativity are always present, even when ordinary mind does not perceive these aspects. 
There's a spontaneity occurring when narratives discuss how Longchenpa discovered the Contra Ningtik and other heart essence texts. He demonstrates how familiarizing, recognizing, and resting in a view allows him to discover texts and comment and instruct on them without prior no knowing. I suggest it is this resting in space when he enters meditation that allows for his creative process to occur. We may broaden this perspective and ask how the relationship between creativity and space function for Tibetan and Buddhist art, and perhaps even for ourselves. Artistic production may not be fueled by a deep meditative state like Longchenpa's, but I do suggest that artists on some level require an epistemological, psychological, and emotional spaciousness. Relaxing and resting in various forms are most likely a vital part for anyone trying to create something from the vast expanse of infinite possibilities. Thank you. You talk about the uh, Samantavadra and the three kayas, which is a very new thing for me to understand Samantavadra in terms of three kayas. So can you please elaborate a little bit more on the three kayas and how you relate it with the Samantavadra? Well, Longchamba relates it to Samantavadra. So I am just reflecting what he says. Uh, and so within the two quotes from the two uh, texts that I was using, the Treasury of Basic Space, and then also the treasure, the scriptural treasure trove, of scriptural transmission. He's he's really he's giving us some descriptors of Samanta Bhadra and then reality itself. Okay, and so I guess going back to what I first said in the paper when we're talking about the essence is empty of inherent nature, and then uh, the nature is uh, luminous, is like a luminosity. And other text, uh, the one that I quote is. The Triyang's Kunche uh, Gelpo, the All Creating Majesty, then explains more of the uh, Sambhogakaya or that light, that luminosity that is also uh, the you know the five Buddha families and the lights, the rainbow lights, rainbow body that comes from that. And so it's really speaking to these kind of luminous and spontaneous presence qualities, so that because everything is empty, then it can arise in these appearances. And then thirdly, the Nirmanakaya um, is Tukje. Uh, so some, some translations I've seen as all pervasive compassion, but it's this energetic quality. And uh, another, uh, another piece that I worked on with uh, Longchamba's poetry is a, a homage to the Cloud Banks of Blessings. Of use. There's the different levels of this Tukje. This the most honorific is this heart mind, which was also then I think is equated to bodhicitta or enlightened mind. So I think, the, you know, equating it, Longchamp is using those and then also giving a few other sorts of um, kind of qualities that are all embodied by Samantabhadra, who is reality itself and an embodiment of all the three kayas as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, it's really exciting because there is other people who are working with Long Chempa this weekend. So that will be uh, interesting and with the idea of space. Um, um, I also have a student in uh, Bhutan who is working on a Long Chempa and a Terma tradition and um, the idea of timelessness. Mm. So bringing something into the past and making it relevant for the present. So if I uh, understand well what you're bringing to the table in terms of um, creativity is that that in itself, a terma, um, or actually being the discoverer of a terma is uh, um, in itself a creative, activity. Would you say that? I think I would say that. And I don't mean it in a creative process is that this person is just producing something new. But I think that also speaks to the way that we create, that it's not always new. We might be in the present moment and that to make what's happening then. But that's arising from, I think, what we see with Longchamba or any sort of Tamar tradition. And I think if we really explore it within ourselves, 
that, you know, this present moment is also a reflection of what has occurred in the past. And however that, you know, lineage or the transmission is almost seems infinite, right? And especially for Long Chamba, it would be infinite. There would be no boundaries because that would all be conceptual manifestations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We will continue now with our third speaker, Mr. Sanjay Shakya. He is a lecturer in Buddhist art history at the Lumbini U Buddhist University, and he is an artist himself specializing in metal sculptures. The legacy of art um, he inherited from his forefathers. He is a gold medalist in Buddhist studies from Chibovan University in the year 2009 for his master's degree, and uh, now is pursuing a PhD research on Buddhist art in Nepal. He explores and analyzes the chronological development on artist embellishment in images of Nepal. His research works devoted to Buddhist art and culture are published in the form of seminar papers, journal articles, and book chapters. The latest of his publications as a chapter writer um, appears in a book entitled Performativity in Buddhism, Reminiscences from the Buddha Theater Festival in 2022. And then there are also many other um, publications, for example, the um, Relevance of the Buddha and Buddhism Today, and another publication is called Intangible Heritage of Patan, um, appeared in 2018. Um, um, Sanjay Chakya's talk today is entitled The Vajrapani Bodhisattva and His Iconic Transformation. So give a round of applause and um, I'm looking forward to this presentation. Thank you. Sarva Buddham Namasyami Dhammam Chajina Vasitam Sangam Chajira Sampannam Ratna Trayayam Naman Meham uh, thank you, organizing committee, for allowing me to speak on um, my paper today. And it's uh, on the specifically the images of Bajrapani and his iconic transformations. So I just want you to relax and uh, see the beautiful pictures here I have collected and uh, getting the information related to, with the images that we have you know, a kind of a legacy that we have in terms of the artistic depictions. But I'm uh, really sorry about the, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, whether you people can see the pictures clearly or not, but uh, I hope uh, you can understand this. Uh, maybe I can use the time while, you know, arranging everything. So uh, I'm getting a little nervous because uh, I'm only standing as a speaker, you know, as a male presenter in front of the all the uh, <laughs> female, <imp> <laughs> female powers. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the only male presenter for now for this session. <laughs> So anyway, it's not about the uh, it's not about the uh, what we call the patriarchy or what we call uh, the gender kind of things. But uh, yeah, of course, I'm going to talk on the male representation, <laughs> the deity uh, we call the Bajrapani. So uh, okay, maybe we can uh, go to the next one. So the objective of uh, my study and the present presentation plan is actually to understand the chronological transformation uh, of Bajrapani mazes and also uh, doing the investigation on the information, I mean, the transformation of the iconographical identity uh, from peaceful to uh, wrathful from how they have been changed or maybe how they were, you know, the wrathful form of Bajrapani is dominating uh, in current time. And uh, the discussions, the topic of discussions will be the iconography of Bajrapani in Buddhist text, how it's supported from the iconographical text. And um, we'll be uh, discussing on the antiquity of the Bajrapani images. 
also um, the rise of Vajrapan in Pali and the Sanskrit literatures. And of course, uh, there is many images and the depictions based on the iconographical text and also uh, the text uh, they were written in Pali and the Sanskrit sources. So the conclusion we will be doing at the end. Uh, so the uh, the first image that uh, you are looking at is the iconic image of Vajrapani from Ajanta Cave. And at the same time, uh, you have uh, the another uh, image of Padmapani, which is dated around 5th century. So from the 5th century to the current Samudraman Singh painting, now we have so many of uh, differences, so many of the iconic, uh, you know, the representation from the very peaceful to the very wrathful uh, presentation or the representation of the uh, Bajrapani images. So this is something that uh, why why there uh, some you know the changes uh, in the images occurred is a very interesting thing for me to explore. Uh, and one another uh, important thing for me is, uh, however, the Padmapani and the Bajrapani they were both seen at the same time in Ajanta. Uh, the Padmapani never changes even today, but uh, the Bajrapani have changes in a different, uh, you know, the timeline or different chronological uh, time period. We can see uh, the different iconographical uh, representation in Bajrapani at least. So this is something very interesting for me. And I think uh, that also is very interesting for you people as well. So the next one, uh, the various depictions, how, and what type of uh, Bajrapani images we can see. You know, there could be the Bajrapani, which is standing alone, and uh, where, where you can see the Bajrapurusa uh, as an acolyte uh, along with him, and uh, the Bajrapani as an attendant of the Buddha along with Padmapani. And of course, uh, after the tantric, uh, uh, you know, the practices in um, India and in Nepal, we can see the wrathful faces of the Vajrapani and completely changing iconographical uh, uh, presentation. So some of the timelines then you can also see here from seven, eight centuries to 13 centuries. You know, this is, this is where you can see uh, the, uh, uh, maybe you can, you can point it out about the timeline when the images of this type uh, can be seen. Uh, in, in Nepal and also in India. So at the same time, after the tantric manifestations, after 12 centuries, before 12th century, of course, you can see some of the images of Pani where he has been depicted uh, in a quite wrathful form, but not in that intense, uh, like uh, the one we previously see of a Samundraman Singh painting and uh, other images that is prevalent in Nepal right now. So, uh, the Bajrapani, yeah, next we can go. So the Bajrapani, uh, it is believed that uh, the, the, the existence of Bajrapani in terms of uh, image is first uh, uh, observed in a bas relief of Gandharan school of art. As you all know, the anthropomorphic image of Buddha was first uh, presented in the Gandharan school of art and uh, the Bajrapani here you can see in a form of uh, Hercules uh, with a completely different iconography. So uh, that's, that iconography is not, we cannot correlate it with the Indian traditions or the Nepalese traditions. It is completely different. Probably the Nepalese and the Indian artists, they completely ignore, probably, probably they completely ignore the iconography iconographical formulas for the Vajrapani they use in the Gandharan School of Art, and uh, they have produced their own uh, way of representing the Vajrapani. So the famous Ajanta and Alara Caves, we have many of uh, his representations and uh, of their own, you know, the native type of representation, I think we can expect uh, specifically from the Alora uh, Caves in India. And uh, as, of course, you know, with the images we, we are looking at, uh, the Buddha is uh, attended by two uh, Bodhisattvas, the Padmapani and the Vajrapani. The Padmapani is always in the right 
side of the Buddha and Vajrapani is always in the left side of the Buddha with uh, his typical uh, styles. I mean, some sometimes you could see uh, Vajrapani is holding the flowers in his right hand and uh, Vajra in his left hand. And sometimes you could see uh, the right hand with, with the Vajra and left hand uh, with the Nilotpala, that is the blue lotus uh, coming coming out from the left hand. And uh, in later times also, as the Vajra Purusa, you know, the anthropomorphic representation of the uh, Vajra in terms of the uh, Vajra Purusa, uh, uh, you can also, you know, we can also see it in the artistic uh, traditions that have been developed. So the Usnis Bijay Shadana, however, it's not uh, the exact, uh, you know, the depiction in Alora as it seems, because in a Usnis Bijay Shadana, uh, from the Sadhana Mala, it says uh, the Bajrapani uh, and uh, the Padmapani, they were standing right and left uh, of the Usnis, Usnis Vijaya, the deity Usnis Vijaya, and uh, right and left. But here, uh, the center figure is not the Usnish Bijay, but the Buddha. So it seems like uh, when the Sadhana Mala were, were uh, collecting, I mean, the, when the Sadhana Sadhanas was created and when the Sadhana Mala was composed, maybe the influence of the uh, artistic depictions, you know, imposed in the Usnish Bijay, um, uh, you know, how the Usnish, is, Usnish Bijay is going to represent. So maybe that is causing the Usnish Bijay Sadhana to incorporate the Bajrapani and the Padmapani. Next, and uh, the strangely, not that strange, but uh, I think uh, it's a good connection in between the Nepalese artist and uh, Indian, you know, the traditions. Because as we say, uh, the fifth, sixth centuries of the Alora and the Ajanta caves, uh, how they were depicting the images, you know, how the Buddha been attended by the Bodhisattvas, we can see exactly uh, in Nepalese context as well. So the sixth century images, one from the Bhaktapur and one from Chopa, that is in Patan, we can see the same sort of, uh, you know, the depictions of uh, Padmapani and uh, Bajrapani. And uh, interestingly, uh, the, the, the second picture as you are looking at, uh, it uh, has an inscription. I don't think it's been uh, studied earlier because recently the renovation, uh, maybe you can say, the floor planning, they were making it and they just found the inscription beneath it in the Jaladroni. So probably later uh, the epigraphist will study and uh, give the proper, you know, the detail about the uh, relief uh, in, a, in the coming future. So anyway, the sixth century images, uh, they have a very similarity with the images in Elora. <clears throat> Next, please. And this is not only the case, but also we have the seven, eight, nine centuries you know, the reliefs which have the same type of, uh, uh, you know, the representations for the Buddha and the Bodhisattva as a trial. Uh, and uh, very interestingly, you know, they have, a, they put very detailed works on it. And uh, uh, one thing is not a good to share, but I think the sixth century, the Guita Chaitya, it's been completely destroyed. Not destroyed as, as we see uh, the picture right now is still in situ, but, uh, uh, they've been tried to steal many times. And at, at that time, you know, as the, you know, they try to taking out, it get, you know, mutilated and the face is not recognizable. So any hands and everything, you know, it's it just uh, broken. Next, please. Uh, the very famous uh, stereotype, I think, uh, around the Lakshavi period in Nepal, we can get it from the Dwakabaha. So uh, the Chaturbhiho Chaite, in my understanding, I think it's a pure Nepalese type of uh, Chaite that you cannot find in India, in my understanding. So uh, the Chaturbhiho Chaite having a four cardinal directions and uh, it is a composition of uh, four bodhisattvas or Buddha and bodhisattva in a combination or uh, only the four Buddhas in four cardinal directions. So this is one seventh century uh, you know, the stupa, which has uh, Buddha and Bodhisattvas. The uh, Bajrapani here you can see is, see here is in uh, the Eastern direction. And uh, here's like a bhanga, not the, you know, the tri tribhanga or something. Uh, 
uh, not the bending, a kind of a samabhanga, uh, samabhanga posture. And with uh, his very calm face, up to 7th century, we could be very sure that uh, in, in Nepalese context, we are not having any wrathful images of the Bajrapani so far, you know, so far discovered yet. Uh, so the Bajra Purusa uh, in a Bajra Hasta uh, and the Bajra coming out uh, from the head of uh, that Bajra Purusa, uh, the left hand of the Bajra Pane is holding that Bajra, the right hand is in Varada. So the very simple way of uh, representing the Bajra Pane and this way is very prevalent in Nepal. Next, please. Um, so from uh, the Alora to the simple solar representations um, uh, from the seventh to eighth centuries, what is my point of uh, you know, explanation is, uh, we have many of the contents, many stops, maybe in terms of the earrings or the hairstyle and everything. We have continued uh, from our uh, past history. So the, this, this particular one, which is dated around seventh to eighth century uh, and it's, it is now, a, now in the Met Museum collection. So the here you can find is a very unique one. So this is not the seventh, eighth century element. So it's a fifth century element from the Gupta tradition in India, which still been used in, in terms of, uh, you know, presenting in the Vajrapani images. And one very striking uh, feature for me, you know, it's a, it's a thing that uh, I don't think, you know, it's, a, it's used in any other deities. That is the earrings. If you can, you know, see the earrings, the left ear having a different types of earring and right ear does not have it. Or maybe if it haven't have, then maybe the another. So the earrings were mismatched. It's not the same. So they were differently, you know, uh, depicted in the images of Bajrapani only because we didn't see any, any of such images which have a different, you know, mismatched earrings. Next, please. Uh, this one is uh, the 9th to 10th century uh, uh, Bajrapani and uh, uh, the Manjushri Mulakalpa, uh, one of the iconographical texts, it says, Bajrapani should be at the right of the golden complexion ornamented wearing Upavita stat with pearls and a shining crown set with jewels, holding a Bajra in the left hand and showing Varada Mudra with the right hand, which is not uh, matched with the picture that I have shown. So my argument in terms of uh, this is, we, we only know, I mean, we only explore those uh, iconographical texts. They were, they were very popular, like the Shadarmala, Nishpanna Yogavali, or the Mools, uh, Manjushri Mool Kalpa, and something like that. But I think uh, since, in my understanding, for the traditional art, uh, we should have a very strong foundation. We, sh we should have a very strong literary support in order to depict uh, the deity in respective manners. So those texts, as they were explaining about the iconographical formulas, some images does not follow only those texts. So the text is there. There could be images which were created based on those texts. And still there are many more texts which were prevalent at that time, but probably we, have, we don't have the chance to look at those, uh, those uh, texts probably uh, because of uh, the absence of those, uh, we are unaware, I mean, not availability of the proper um, iconographical formulas that uh, we need to understand in terms of specific deities. Next, please. So the same uh, iconographical explanation as in Manjushri Mulikalpa, you can see it in this image. The Manjushri Mulkalpa is also explaining the another uh, iconographical formulas, and uh, they're giving the proper, you know, uh, use of those iconographical formulas in the images. Next, please. So, as I mentioned earlier, different forms of uh, transfer transformation in the Bajrapani images. Please, next. And this one, the Chaturvihu Chaiti again. 8th and 9th century images, you can still go and see those uh, magnificent images in Patan. Uh, so the 8th century, the Kashmir, they were also having the wrathful form of uh, Bajrapani, uh, which is not that aggressive as it looks, 
but of course we can see he's in very anger. Next, please. Uh, seated Vajrapani, of course, we can have that. Uh, we can see that. And also the Vajrapanis where, uh, you know, he is, uh, he is calling the Vihaka Adipati because uh, he's, you know, the three mysteries. He, he precise over the three mysteries of the body, speech, and mind of the Tathagata. That is why he is also called the Vihaka Adipati. And that is what you can see, you can find it in many, many of the literatures. Now, the come, uh, come to the 13th century, and uh, we have a chanda. Now, the wrathful form of the Vajrapani is uh, uh, coming, in, uh, coming in light. So many, the uh, Pali texts, they were explaining about the ferocious nature you know, of the Vajrapani. From the Pali text, uh, Pali sources, and uh, from the Sanskrit sources, I'm not going to read it out. So some of the uh, sutras that I need to mention is the Ambatta Sutta, uh, also in the Sarvastivada Vinaya Sutra. And one thing I think I need to mention you, we're doing the circumambulation Kora in the right, uh, making uh, keeping the Chaitya in the right. So if you people or we are go going in the another, you know, another direction, then Vajrapani is going to hit you. So that is what is mentioned in the Sarvastivada Vinaya with his Vajrakuta. So next one. Uh, yeah, the 13th to 14th century, as I mentioned, uh, the common Vajrapani images that we are seeing these days are of this type. Uh, extended the right hand and the Vajra in his right, right hand, and the left hand is in Terzini. But one interesting thing is, uh, these days we can also see the Vajra Pasa. Uh, and it's uh, not possible for me to find the, any sadhanas which, which can connect the Vajra Pasa, uh, you know, holding the Vajra Pasa with the Vajrapani. Maybe it's a uh, limited of the study that I made. The next one, please. Uh, Kala Chakra Mandala, I put it here because the, at the time of Kala Chakra tradition, Kala Chakra, you know, the practices, the angry form of Vajrapani seems to be very prevalent. So the 12th century onwards in Tibetan traditions or from the influence of the Tibetan traditions, we can now see the um, wrathful form of images which overshadowed uh, shadowed the peaceful form of images. Next one. So the Kala Chakra Mandala and these two places, we can see the uh, Vajrapani Bajra, with his tantric formations. He has three heads, six hands, and also the Sabda Vajra as his consort in two, two, uh, two of the gates. Uh, you, we can see this form of uh, Vajrapani. It's also called the Maha Chakra Vajrapani. Next, please. And uh, in Nepalese context, uh, Slosser has uh, rightly pointed that uh, in the Kathmandu Valley, as the cult of Indra waxed, that of Bajrapani waned. And in the first picture, we probably have, you know, in, in our first glance, we get confused and we may uh, recognize him as a Bajrapani, which is absolutely not. He's not the Bajrapani, but the Indra, because of the iconographical formula of uh, horizontal eye in his forehead. So the same same type of uh, iconographical, you know, the representations. However, uh, the Indra is very very popular around the 13th century in Nepalese context. So many of the festivals, as of course the Indra Jatra we recently celebrated, and uh, Indra is very popular during that time. Next, please. So uh, the earrings, as I mentioned earlier, you can see it completely, you know, clearly. The left ear having a different earrings, and the right having a different one. Next, please. So thanks to the Vajrapani for discourse on Nama Sangeti, request on the discourses of the, you know, the Nama Sangeti to the Buddha. And he's the one key person uh, for the Nama Sangeti recitation, uh, you know, request to the Buddha. And uh, finally, I'm not going to read it out. So last, again, uh, last one is another picture. Next one, please. So this is also the Vajrapani with a completely different iconographic representation. Thank you so much for everything. Yeah. We will start again with a few questions from the panelists. It's about the or comments from the panelists. Are you hearing me? Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Um, 
I guess I'm interested in um, the idea that the iconography um, would not necessarily be influenced by Gandharian art, partly because I'm making the opposite statement in the coming presentation. <laughs> so, so I think it's an interesting in discussion. So to what extent Gandharian art would have influence and to what extent it wouldn't have influence. So the from India, there might have been influence from um, Hindu iconography. So maybe you could maybe speak about that and then we can debate later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, it, it was not my statement, by the way, that the Hellenistic uh, approach uh, towards the uh, Bajrapani and his uh, different iconographical formulas um, is from the, uh, I think, uh, the Pratapdita Pala. He argued in that way. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it can connect uh, with the anthropomorphic representation for the Buddha. And uh, yeah, of course, they were very, um, very uh, good with the, you know, uh, the, the deities. They have their own, so maybe the Hercules is very popular at that time, and uh, uh, maybe because of that they have uh, very close connections. And uh, the Gandharas they put the uh, Bajrapani in terms of uh, their Hercules uh, attitude. So it seems uh, logical to me. It seems very logical to me. And uh, of course, you know, as the Buddhism going you know, st started and uh, spreading all, all over the world. And uh, their influence is very, very strong, I guess. So maybe, as we can argue it, because the A.K. Kumaraswamy, he also argues that the, uh, maybe the Sarnata school of, uh, you know, the Buddhist, uh, Buddhist, Sarnath Buddhist school of art, they have produced the first, uh, you know, the Buddha images. He kind of argue with it. And, uh, his his point is in one way i think is uh i think it's uh, uh, maybe recognizable because uh the native indian style of uh, uh, representing the buddha could be from the sarna school of art but uh, the first image i think is from the gandhara school of art yeah From the Gandhar School of Art, I see also, especially in the eight uh, relief panels uh, that depict Buddha's life, there are uh, uh, the images of Vajrapani, and uh, most of them are very varying. So I think just to uh, talk about only that Herculean image, I think we need to also uh, look a little bit more deeper because some of them are bearded and all also. So um, uh, but, but we see the presence of Vajrapani uh, at that time, yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you all for the contributions. We will have the discussion in the big round afterwards, okay. yeah? Sounds good. Yeah. Um, if there's no more questions from the panelists, we will move on to our fourth and uh, last presentation of this morning. We have a collaborative presentation by Swasti Rajmandari Kayasta and Diane Denis, entitled Stylistic Characteristics of Early Pauba Paintings of Nepal, Influences and Implications. So to present to you briefly our speakers, Swasti Kayasta is a lecturer for the MA Museology and Buddhist Collection Program and a lecturer in Buddhist art history at Lumbini University. Lubini Buddhist University. She is an avid writer in the field of Nepal cultural heritage and has a monthly column titled Heritage Tales in the monthly magazine ECS Nepal. She is an executive board member of um, ECOM or ICOM Nepal chapter and provides lectures on Nepali culture to tourist groups. And then of course, Diane, I don't know if I have to present you again. <laughs> my dear colleague, Diane. <laughs> so I invite you both uh, to come here. I don't know how you, yes, you I have think thought I'm about how you will this. organize this.
Thank you, Julia, for the introduction. Just waiting for the presentation to load. Uh, so our presentation is about uh, um, uh, stylistic characteristics of early Pauba paintings of Nepal and its philosophical uh, influences and implications. This presentation was born out of the wish to weave our respective fields of expertise, museology and art history and Buddhist studies uh, through, through sharing different historical, aesthetical, cultural and philosophical concerns. What follows leads us to consider a connection between traditional art practices of Nepal, discussing here Pauba paintings and the Yogachar school of thought. The arts of Nepal in its variety of forms, sculptures in terracotta, wood, stone, metal, as well as paintings on walls, manuscript illuminations and cloth have withstood the test of time in their excellence of executions to the minutest details of physiognomy and anatomy in a suitable ambience. The artistic practices have evolved to be a cumulative combination and exchange of various resources gathering momentum from one work to another, evolving into an indigenous aesthetic style that exposes unique creativity and skill, which distinguishes the Nepali art from, the, from that made in the, rest, in the region around. Its substance with creative usage is transformed to new contexts, and as stated by Stella Kremrich in the exhibition catalog, Art of Nepal, 19, 1964, Eclectism and constant and conscious borrowing are part of this process. So within the multitude of yes, Himalayan tradition, the act of borrowing, copying, reproducing is akin to the development of wisdom, especially within the tantric spiritual path, where one consciously emulates desirable qualities as a step towards the development of one's full potential. Were text, oral transmission, or visualization necessarily used within this artistic training of Pauba painting since the early development? I'm not in a position to tell, at least not a scholarly position to tell. But whatever the case may be, it is quite tempting here to consider connection between the artistic discipline and Yogacara school of thought. The term Yogacara literally means yoga practice or one whose practice is yoga. This school is also called Vijnavavada and Vijnaptivada, which means that it is interested in how perception and knowledge occurs and in the consequence that is um, that it is produced on one's experience. So let me reword that. So it's interested in knowledge and how this knowledge influences our experience. And in this type of knowledge, there are two types. One that is conditioned or impure, or we could say conceptual, and one that is pure, or we could say um, direct, or we call um, we also call it unconditioned, non-dual. So, with this in mind, the tradition of visualization of deities within the MLN communities and its artistic tradition is int intimately linked, in my mind, to this understanding. Since habitual thinking rules condition perception, why not use? repeated exposure to deities and to pure realms as a way to habituate oneself to wakefulness. Pauba painting, whether as an artistic discipline or a religious artifact, can be just that, a training through seeing. And that's what I connect with um, our presentation before and Shaftel's presentation of blessings. We will continue some more. 
In Nepal, the continuity of the practice of Pauba paintings and consistency in style till present times is a witness of its social and cultural value that has surpassed its spiritual and, uh, and aesthetic grandeur and since antiquity remains as an identifying factor of this Himalayan nation. In the same catalog, Premrish mentions the skill and facility in the arts of Nepal had struck early Buddhist travelers from China, providing evidence of its antiquity to go beyond the early years of the fourth century CE Evidences from stone inscriptions recovered in Chabel also mentions the practice of paintings during the Lichavi period. However, this confirmation can only be attested as early as the 11th century CE through the Ashtasahasrika Pragya Paramita, a palm leaf manuscript now in the collection of the University of Cambridge Library. That is what you can see there. It is complicated to determine when and where Pauba paintings originated due to the highly perishable nature of the cotton canvas. Because of the fragile nature of the painting, we only know of those made after the 12th century. These paintings are very conservative in their visual imagery, as well as the process of their making. They follow a strict linear layout with, a straight, with straight uh, arrangements of rows and columns, Pauba paintings are not only beautiful images on the surface, but evoke deep philosophical insights into the art of life. They serve as a tool for the viewer. Each symbol, color, figure, and pattern aid a practitioner into their meditative visualization. For their painting, for their making, the painting, the patron, the artist, and the priest are the are, according to me, considered the four pillars upon which the sacred artworks evolve. So the, the term sacred here, used by Swashti, um, could be interpreted from a Yogacara point of view as what has the potential to bring awakening, to remind oneself of the nature of mind, pure and luminous, as Rene told us before. I should already note, though, that there are several interpretation of yoga, Yogacara school covering different periods of development from the fourth century up to this day, since many people are using Yogacara still today. Yet one can say that it is necessarily rooted in the Prajnaparamita Sutra literature and deconstructive by nature. And it is Undeniable that it has influenced most cultures where philosophers embraced its system, India, Nepal, Tibet, China, Japan, Korea. What is important also is that the composition of its foundational text in the north of India coincide with the artistic Gandharian period. And that's where the discussion um, comes in. Gandhara region is a birthplace of the brothers, Asanga and Vasubandhu both considered as the founders of Yogacara thought and closely related to the figure of Maitreya. In this mountain region is an important pass known as the Khyber uh, Pass and scriptural and archeological testimonies show intensive exchanges between Elistic, Iranian, Chinese, Indian culture from the fourth century BCE onwards. So, quite early, yeah? The Gandharian art style incorporated many motifs of classical Roman art, including the copious cloth with its multitude of folds, columns, seat, ornate backgrounds, as are often found in the Himalayan Paubo painting. And since I'm not really a specialist in the art, um, I leave the discussion open on that. Pauba paintings are generally considered to be religious paintings. However, it has sometimes been also made to document a cultural activity like the renovation of a shrine, the life cycle ritual celebrations of Bhim Ratha Rohan and others. As stated by Pratap Aditya Pal in his book, Arts of Nepal 2, he, two as in two, <laughs> uh, the, the Newar word pauba, which refers to these kinds of paintings, could be derived from two Sanskrit words, pratibha and prabha. 
Pratibha literally means an image and Prabha means splendor or radiance, capturing the likeness or qualities of the divine, very appropriately phrased because these paintings carry visual imagery of the sacred and through their stylistic representations radiate with spiritual and aesthetic aura. Another explanation of the word Pauba is believed to be derived from the Sanskrit term Patra, Bhattaraka, which means divine in platform according to eminent Pauba artist Lok Chitrakar. In general, it is understood as being derived from the Sanskrit word Pata, translating to painted cloth, referring to the vertical format of paintings on cloth discussed in this research. However, from the inscription of the Vishnu Mandal uh, Pauba uh, of the 15th century, we do know of certain, we do know certainly that during the 15th century, these paintings were referred to as Pata. The inscription of this painting mentions that the painting Idam Pata was painted Likitam by Teja Varma Somasa Raman on the occasion of the performance of a Vaishnava rite by him and his family. In her exhibition catalogue, The Arts of Nepal, Kremrish also refers to these paintings as Pata in 1964. Another book published in 1979 mentions the Newar paintings as Pata, that is the Sanskrit word, or Pauba, that is the new word, or, pra, or Patti Bahara, that is the old and new. And these annotations provide us information that the currently used term Pauba is fairly recent. So then, although the term of this style of painting is fairly recent, we could say that the techniques of visualizations associated with it are ancient. And with it, as with the Yogacara school, comes anthropomorphic representation of the Buddha and bodhisattvas like Maitreya. In the Pratyutpana Sutra, a particularly important text in Kashmir, dating from the second century, describes a practice of recalling to mind or bringing to mind, so the Sanskrit term smriti, or we could say drenpa in Tibetan, associated also with vipassana. Um, so the, the exercise is to bring to mind the presence of the Buddha or of a bodhisattva like Maitreya. To receive his teaching through samadhi and put them into practice and to teach them. And you can find this information with, uh, in the work of Harrison. The testimony left by Hui Lan, a Chinese monk who died between 457 and 464, um, also shows a devotion to Maitreya in Kashmir. And you can find this information in Davidson's work. Hui Lan mentions that his Kashmirian master, during a visit to Tushita, had obtained the initiation of Mahayana teachings, Tek Chen, in Tibetan, from Maitreya himself. And these practices seem akin to the present, present tradition of Himalayan paintings and their spiritual importance. And I would add, as Aronson points out, for Buddhism, meditation is a method of authentication and legitimation. The painting, the subject of the Pauba paintings, as mentioned earlier, are mostly religious iconography and sometimes narrative of ritual or cultural events. The purpose of painting these resplendent sacred images of various Hindu and Buddhist deities in earlier times were as tools for rituals and veneration activities. Religion was the primary motivation factor behind the artworks of Nepal. The various narratives elaborated in the mythologies, the large pantheon of deities provided the repertoire of inspiration. The religious subject matter can encompass the Hindu and Buddhist deities with no stylistic difference in their execution. The intricate and sublime paintings we see when completed are more than what meets the eye. They have an immense support system in the form of iconographic manuals, and, prescribe the, and that prescribe the canons of iconography, iconometry of the sacred being, as uh, Sanjay ji mentioned earlier. The creative process of the artist involved visualization and conceptualiza conceptualization 
of the composition together with referring to dhyanas or the different iconographical texts, as he mentioned, as Sanjayji mentioned, uh, that provide the basic schema of the, of the image to the artist, like physical description, dress, ornament, implementations held in the hand, and others. Since the art was mostly religious, the artist followed strict process to conceptualize and realize the form of the subject through unflinching concentration and total control of physical and mental emotions while maintaining a purity of mental and physical state as well. So what if this unflinching concentration and the ability to maintain purity of mind was described from a Yogacara point of view, what could we say? We would say that all appearances are the result of a process of perception. Perception by nature, by nature is creative. All that appears is the gift of the mind. Giving form to a deity, whether through visualization or through painting, from a Yogacara yoga point of view, is akin to contemplating the nature of mind, empty yet manifesting. And for example, in the Dhamma Dhammata Vibhaga Karika, a fourth century text attributed to Maitreya, put into writing by Asanga, one can find a very practical step-by-step -step approach toward pure perception or direct perception. This stanza, stanza, which I studied extensively during my PhD studies, could give insight into how painting or how seeing the form of a deity on canvas may actually lead to non-dual direct experience, open into non-conceptual fundamental wisdom. To do this, one, familiarize was, one familiarizes oneself with the fact that all that appears is an interpretation only. Both the appearance and what is seen, of what is seen and of what sees are interpretation only. Once this realized the nature of the appearance, suchness can be revealed. This is what leads to non-dual awareness, free from concept, direct experience. So I'll go over again. First step is looking at the appearance and remembering that all appearances are interpretation only. So the process of a process of perception, right? process of perception, the result of a process of perception. Then, we have the subject. So what is this process of perception? So the process of perception is also interpretation only. So then the mind is left open, spacious, and relaxed. Those are the steps that this text is inviting us. So the notion of purity here comes from dropping all conceptual fabrication, hence, the form of a deity and the nature of the mind are, in essence, not different, completely pure. The common characteristic features of early Pauba paintings are seen in the strongly figurative compositions from what we know as the oldest till the present times. The principal deity is centrally uh, positioned, either seated or standing in the prescribed pose gracefully demonstrating the identifying gestures of the hand together with holding the required attributes. The flawlessly executed figures are clad in opulent garments and an abundance of jewelry worn on the head, neck, ears, arms, wrist, waist, as well as the feet, uh, appending the divine lineament. The majesty and aura of the principal deity was augmented by the hardly or highly ornate thrones and shrines in harmonious compositions. The panoply of other figures, either demigods or characters of the narrative, and sometimes even patron figures, enliven the composition with their animated gestures. Vivid and bold hues fill the composed form in flat colors, 
shading is minimalized and used only to highlight the structural spaces and add subtle dimensions, but not to create uh, or indicate any perspective or shadow. Deities, lay figures, halos, thrones, buildings, motifs, patterns, vegetations, all merge into a harmonious whole built up by rhythmic interplay of lines and forms contributing to the spiritual atmosphere as well as the visual aesthetic. These stylistic characteristics have been the foundation of Nepali Pauba paintings, which have evolved through centuries, assimilating numerous changes and innovations, and are still practiced today as an indigenous art form. Not only is there a continuity of its practice, but also the continuity of its collections by art collectors and reputed museums globally, with a small addition of the artist's name inscribed in stylistic emblems or simply signed and dated. So as a conclusion from my side of things, it's been wonderful to work with Swashti on this. From the perspective of Yogacara, the sacredness of Pauba painting does not reside in the object itself, not even on the, in the four pillars of producing a genuine uh, piece of art, but in its capacity to wake us up. I imagine that would work with statues also. This sacredness lies in the type of seeing that goes beyond object and subject, in other words, in one's training to see things as they are. Only then can the deity's presence, and here is Swashti's um, um, work, the deity's presence, um, can be experienced as being no different than the mind that sees. Thank, so, you. thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful collaborative presentation. Again, we will have just a few questions now and um, that will be followed by my response. Are there questions? It's basically from you and Anne at this point. I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment, so excuse <laughs> me if it comes across as a comment. <laughs> I'm not trying to eat up more space. Uh, so I think it's really interesting because from what I'm hearing you say that you interpreting or looking through this with a yoga chara lens is really looking at perception itself, right? In the way of engaging with tanka or artwork or, you know, maybe physical objects that would be part of this seeing pure perception. And what started to come up into my mind is that then you know, we see this a lot. We see this with Yogacara. We see this with Dzogchen. We see this with the way that Longchenpa interprets uh, Maha Yoga practices, right? That it's turning away from maybe the lower tantras that are really about action and things like this ritual practice and turning it towards a mind practice, a seeing practice, right? And so I kind of start to think about this as you were both speaking and then thinking also about the artists themselves, because in a way, they're very much doing an action by creating. Right. And so I'm just wondering, would you take then this idea of perception into their uh, actual physical process of creating tankas or creating statues as well? Or do you see that maybe slightly different? What a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think that. Um, in some way, the artist is no different than the seer. So, and in some way, uh, creating art of work and living everyday life, not different. So it, re it really connects with what you were saying. We're not really different from Long Chenpa. In some way, wisdom is accessible all at all times. And it is... Um, in some way, our own training that can reveal itself. So the consequence of on, on our experience. And so definitely, I, I, um, I feel like our presentation connects there at that level. And I think that's what I've emphasized in the class with our students 
in the Buddhist art class also. So this is accessible at all times, right? So I don't know if you would like to say something. Actually, not so much on that, but I think uh, uh, about the same concept uh, as you mentioned in your class. So therefore, uh, that resulted in this exhibition. I think none of the students besides Dawa or Sonam, one of them is a, uh, None of the, none of you are artists, but then, you know, because of the knowledge you enhance, you could even become artists. I think that's what I just got to add. So uh, maybe a kind of a commenting or a statement. Uh, well, um, um, the, everything, you know, because since the picture is a, a collaborative work of two experts, uh, I, I, I just found something like, uh, because, we, the art creator, in, in that sense, uh, we understand like uh, everything is starting from the shunyata. Although Ivaja Sangra is talking about the shunyata, it started with the shunyata and it finally, you know, you know, it, it just uh, completed with the shunyata. You try to connect it with the perceptions, right? So yoga achara and uh, shunyata, how you think is uh, going together in order to, you know, in order to have a creations like the paintings or whatever the forms of art, do you think does it have any kind of uh, you know connections? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely, and there is a lot of debates, right? Sometimes yoga chara are, are considered as uh, not uh, being strong enough on the shunyata aspect. But definitely in the research that I've done and some other people are doing also, um, uh, Yogacara is definitely in connection with the Prajnaparamita literature. And so definitely in accord that everything arises from shunyata and dissolve into shunyata. And even when it's manifesting is no different than shunyata. And so there's definitely um, uh, something to say about that. And I think this is uh, really interesting when I imagine working with metal because metal is so strong, right? And giving us a sense of re concrete reality, almost unchanging reality, um, but um, already being able to take something that is without clear form and giving it a form is already connecting with Shunyata. And so that would be the connection to make with emptiness in there. Would that make sense to you? Yeah. All right. So thank you so much. Um, I will continue now with a short response. Afterwards, we will open the floor for your questions. So please take note of your questions and sorry that I couldn't take them before. Um, the response that I wrote was based on um, the previous version that I got every um, presentation, just like artwork evolved in the meantime. Um, these, four ex uh, these four presentations um, explored visual art in Buddhism from various perspectives, which together give us an understanding of the rich cultural uh, culture of visual art in Buddhism, a treasure as the title rightly points out. Visual art is ubiquitous in Tantric Buddhism. Tantric sadhanas are basically guides through worlds of visualizations, yeah, and thereby through visual art. The point of departure for a meditator in a Tantric sadhana is emptiness. Yeah? There is um, uh, often the mantra at the beginning of a sadhana in the butchered trans, uh, pronunciation that I learned. Uh, we always said, Om Subhava Shuddha Sarvadama Subhava Shuddha Hang. All things are by nature pure, I am by nature pure. Out of this pure, spacious emptiness, the tantric meditator fills their space with luminous manifestations of deities, of palaces, of Buddha lands. Um, Rene Ford explored this fundamental space of all creative manifestation, aptly calling it a canvas, the foundation on which creativity expresses itself. René used the teachings of the Nyingma master Long Chenpa to describe this canvas as vibrant spaciousness, spontaneous presence, and all pervasive compassion that is suffused with wisdom. 
Renee suggests that all artists, in fact, all creative people, tap into this space as the springboard into creativity. They might not be aware of it, or they might not have a deep realization. However, artistic work starts out of an empty space. Contemplative practices help master the access to that dimension. Rene suggests with Long Chenpa that it is through the subtle art of relaxing and resting that meditators and artists contact this source of all art. Long Chenpa gives a threefold description of the foundational empty canvas. Besides being spacious and spontaneously present, he says it is imbued with all pervasive compassion. Some questions emerge from that. If all that arises on this canvas is equally empty, is it also equally good? If out of the awake spacious mind, all art arises spontaneously, why is there so much regulation in Buddhist religious art? While Rene's paper looked at this spacious fundamental ground, um, the next two papers, actually, I thought we would have Rene first, discussed the form aspects of material manifestation, and the final paper explored the creative process itself. So we had Anne Shaftel talking about Buddhist art from the perspective of preservation and restoration. She told us about restoration endeavors that have attempted to perfect the original, endeavors that have sometimes led to mistakes and falsifications. This approach implies that there is indeed a correct and a false way within creative expression. Sanjay Shakya talked, uh, Sanjay Taka's talk gave us a vivid case study of the rigorous framework of iconographic art. His presentation relied on an impressive range of textual research on the Bodhisattva Vajrapani. His talk showed us that precise specific formulas of iconography have their source in the precise description of the liturgical literature of the tradition. When we talk about Buddhist visual art, we might spontaneously picture geometric mandalas on Tibetan or Nepalese scroll paintings that are highly organized, composed according to geometric rules. We all have seen those sketches yeah, of Buddha figures with numerous lines that determine the exact dimensions. This begs the question, if the fundamental ground is understood as being spaciousness and spontaneous presence, why were the sacred expressions of it so determined, so rigorous and structured, not a free-flowing circle that we see below in the hall? Anne's and Sanjay's talk both addressed an interesting polarity in their presentation, namely impermanence versus continuation. Just like anything else, Buddhist art is impermanent. Meditation instructions advise not to hold on to fleeting phenomena. Meditators try not to hold on while the artist attempts to make things last. Restoration of Buddhist art even prolongs this continuity. This is the art of skillfully holding on, called preservation. Anne's explanations of digital recreation of Buddhist treasures showed how the tension between impermanence and continuation beautifully melts into one by making impermanence even more ephemeral. And there I'm referring to this artificial intelligence that displays illusion of form, illusion of matter of the immaterial world. While being more exact, the digital arc artwork is also less intrusive, we were told. Sanjiji's discussion of the iconography of Vajrapani demonstrated impermanence and continuation in a different way. Despite the very precise rules of iconography and iconometry that exists in Buddhist literature, Vajrapani managed to make a complete turnaround from a peaceful to a wrathful deity. Other equally astonishing examples are actually Avalokiteshvara, yeah, who changes gender when he becomes a female deity moving to China, or actually even the, the Buddha image itself that changes from an an iconic depiction as, for example, the Bodhi tree or the Dharma wheel into an iconic form that is as a human being, human form. So then in the final presentation, Swasti Kayasta and Diane, uh, Diane Denis explored this 
seeming polarity in Buddhist art between spacious spontaneity and iconographic restriction by exploring the Pauber paintings of Nepal. Pauber artists follow strict processes to conceptualize, realize, and give form to their object. However, the dissolution of this polarity begins when we look at the process of creativity itself, Swasti and Dian explained. In the creative process, restrictions become the frame in which spontaneity may express itself. From the Yogacara perspective, the process of creativity reveals the purpose of Buddhist art. The artist creates art by maintaining an, and here I quote from, from the talk, an unflinching concentration and total control of physical and mental emotions while maintaining a purity of their mental and physical state. This is the mental state, not only of the artist, but also of the tantric meditator who uses the visualization as a means to awakening. Dian cited from the Dharma Dharma Tavibhaga that explains the progressive steps from focusing externally on the sacred art object to turn inwardly and resting in the perceiving mind. When the distinction between object and subject dissolves, the highest purpose of Buddhist visual art is achieved. With that, the various presentations of this panel have taken us on a journey from the ground and origin of creativity to various forms and formalized expressions of art and back to the dimension in which mind and form are one. But more questions are left unanswered. Long Chenba's threefold description of the mind mentions spaciousness, spontaneous presence, and all pervasive compassion. If art is created from this dimension of mind, is art automatically an expression of compassion? What makes art compassionate? Is it in the object? Is it in its purpose? Or is it in the eye of the beholder? The compassion. Yeah. With these questions, I would like to open the floor for further discussions. And I would like to invite the panelists to sit up here and maybe you can arrange yourself so that the audience can see you directly. Maybe some helper can help with the chairs. That would be great. Well, since I brought up some questions in my talk, um, I will open the panel by asking if anyone would like to comment or answer on any of those. And uh, meanwhile, gather your questions and get hold of a microphone, and then it's going to be your turn. Um, and we have here this microphone to give around. And I was told. I see Renee has the mic, please. If I speak this way, is this one picking me up or should I use this? It's okay? Okay. A little closer? Yeah. Yeah. How's this? It's okay. Uh, Julia, I get the first question uh, that you asked in your response of the sense of what, how would, let's see, that if all, why is there so much regulation in Buddhist art? And I think my, I think I could answer this in many different ways, but I think one thing I want to comment on would be coming from Long Chimpa's uh, biography in the sense, you know, Long Chimpa was a monk and grew up in the monastery and uh, then was put, was in exile into Bhutan for a long time. And I think looking at this in a sense, this is his interpretation, right? We're always talking of interpretations. And so in one sense, he would be very uh, familiar with regulation, right? Coming from the monastic communities. 
and then also being very familiar with this sense of uh, resting in space and it's being kind of spontaneous and maybe it's it can seem eschewing that sense of discipline and regulation uh, but through his writings when you look at something like uh, the treasury of philosophical systems he's quite precise and does address regulation within the philosophy itself and being very precise and in the text that i use uh, the treasury of basic space is sometimes kind of understood to be this uh, expression of him resting of you know doing these higher zokshan practices so i think when i speak about this through long chimba this is his lens that he's using as this, this resting in space so i'm not sure that he would sit there and go well you know there's no sense for regulation in art or you know tonka painting or in philosophy or anything else that there would it's just depending on the the lens that's being used at the time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. If I've been asked to say something, then I'll say something. I've um, been documenting Buddhist painters since 1970. And what has really interested me is two types. One is uh, Lok Chuchukar, for example, who no longer works from the grid system. He allows himself complete freedom to give the energy of the deity um, by changing the prescribed um, proportions. This is according to his own description. And the second is, which is wonderful, and the second is the type of Tanka painter who and um, is very rare. And that is a great yogi or teacher who's also a trained tanka painter and who is not painting something that comes from a description in, in a text. It, they're painting a tanka that comes from their own realization. For example, their own inspiration of a deity or uh, as a guide to a practice. So if you're asking about, discussing about um, the freedom that an artist has, yes or no, um, within the constraints of all the grid system or the rules of the text, there are those that uh, do not use them at all. And I've been documenting those types of artists. I find them quite interesting. And their art definitely has a different quality to it. Thanks. What? In the very beginning, I saw um, Shireen having her hand up. Do you, do you remember your question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. oh Dharma yes. friends. Okay. <laughs> I had many questions because these are all amazing presentations. They're really stimulated. I've boiled it down to two, if I'm allowed to. So one is to uh, Anne, uh, and, but it will speak to the subject of blessings also, because I was thinking about, first you mentioned that for some sacred works that have been in museums for 200 years, did they still carry the charge of blessings? You said you consulted with different masters and they had various opinions. So now I wanna ask this question in the context of your beautiful digital restorations. And you said that unfortunately, when some pecha are being digitized, then the actual object is being kind of left to the elements and is not being uh, preserved in the same way. So I guess my question is, do you feel or have masters said that these digitizations or these digital restorations, um, do they carry blessings or? It's hard, it's hard to say in general. But in specific, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago when prints became more common. And I, asked, I was at one event with a great teacher. I think you were there too. And he, in, he wanted to have a, an image created for a teaching. And instead of paying a tanka painter to paint one beautiful image that would take a long time and there'd be one for the people who were there. He had um, prints made 
and um, they surround the surround was not exceptionally expensive and the print was not exceptionally well pixelated it was and I, I asked why through a translator and the answer was that this way more students would have access to to these tanka and so that was it, it, that was one of the first where I, I realized that um, the diversity of opinion on that question is uh, immense. And um, yeah, and then through the years when I've asked about the museum question, there has been a range of answers um, without giving names, but because I don't like to say this person said this or this person said that unless I have the quote right in front of me, lest I make a slight mistake, which would change your understanding of what they actually said. And of course, what they actually said is filtered through often through a translator. But in actual fact, um, the range about the museum question, and it included uh, collectors in New York who would have sacred iconography hanging in their guest washrooms, etc. And you know, that question, one teacher answered that it would take uh, an actual destruction by fire or water or burying to destroy the power of a tanka. Another said that um, whether the empowerments were still in the tanka or not, if it was in a museum for a long time, in actual fact, the point of it more so was that all those museum go goers that would come in and see this, not, ex not coming with out of devotion or not coming expecting to see a tanka or Buddhist art at all, would be exposed to the seed, seed of merit that would positively affect them in this or future lives. And that that was more the point. And I always, that always stuck with me. I really um, remember how powerful that answer was. Thank you. So I'm gonna be greedy. Um, so the next question is about the kind of anti-perspectivalism or lack of depth in Pauba paintings and how that connects to them as a possible method of support. Because from what I understood from your talk, and all I know about Pablo paintings, I just learned from your talk, so excuse me. So you said there is some shading, there is some shadowing. So it's not that the artist didn't have the capacity to render depth, um, but there seems to be this insistence on the flatness or the non-perspectivalism. So I'm wondering if as an aid to a meditative practice, is there some philosophical or soteriological uh, edge or aspect to this flatness? <laughs> I'm not really in a pos scholarly position to answer that question, <laughs> but I find the question very interesting. So, because, uh, and, and it touches upon um, um, uh, so much of the art that we see um, in Nepal, sometimes in India, this, this insistence on flatness and, and uh, why is that considered beautiful? What is the aesthetic of that? And, and our reaction is often conditioned by what we're used to. <laughs> so if we're used to having uh, three-dimensional or at least the sense of three-dimension, then we're kind of in expecting something. So in, in some way, it's a mirror for our own expectations, um, but it might be a mirror for something else within the tradition of the Newar or... Um, it, it's the same thing. We um, only now, I think uh, in the late 20th century and the 21st century, we see artists, uh, which we call contemporary paubas now. Uh, they they make the deities in full uh, 3D forms. Uh, even uh, since we are referring many times to Lok Chitrakar, who is uh, the eminent artist right now, pauba artist, the traditional artist, he also does not make uh, uh, his uh, uh, paintings in 3Ds. It's uh, mostly flat, but there are very slight uh, shadings uh, just uh, for gradation and perspective is totally ruled out uh, since uh, very ancient times. 
till today. Uh, I wouldn't say till today because again, I did mention that perspective is not added, but uh, the forms come in 3D. That is a very recent uh, stylization feature. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear myself. So I guess that answers my question. Um, my question is for Mr. Sakyaji. Uh, so you mentioned uh, Vajra Purusha, the sort of attendant of Vajrapani. Um, some of the other attendant figures with other bodhisattvas like Hayagriva with Lokeshwara and uh, Yamantaka with Manjushri sort of in the tantric tradition rise to their own sort of prominence and become considered even an emanation of that deity or a wrathful sort of the other side of the coin of the, the peaceful and wrathful sort of side. Whereas I'm not so familiar with Vajra Purusha, do in the Newa tradition, do we see Vajra Purusha sort of rising to any sort of prominence or, and, and if not, uh, sort of as a meditational deity in, in his own right? And if not, do you have any idea why that might be? Well, uh... Yeah, you're true in the sense that we have many deities who have their acolytes uh, standing, uh, standing or maybe seated uh, or maybe kneeling down some in, in next to the main image. Uh, Bajrapurus, uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, transformations, I guess uh, Bajrapurus seems very wrathful, uh, even you know in the initial in in the starting images that I have uh, shown here, uh, Bajrapurus is considered to be the manifest, uh, not the manifestation, but the anthropomorphized form of the Bajra. So that is why uh, the Bajra is coming out from the head, and uh, yeah, he is in uh, uh, binay hasta, like uh, he is just is is like uh, he is very obedient. Uh, to the to his deity, so I think uh, uh, it's in a in a way of uh, you know tantric practices that uh, has a manifestation of the bazara in different forms, and it's also some some text is suggesting that uh, all the strength of the deities is coming from the bazara family. So maybe because uh, since the bazara pani, as its name suggests, the bazara and the pani. Bajra means, as we all understand, as a thunder, thunderbolt, and uh, Pani is the hand. So uh, he's the one with the ha uh, with the Bajra in his hand, and that is given a very beautiful, you know, uh, creation of a Bajra Purusha for the Bajra Pani, which is completely uh, 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 particular with the Bajra Pani only. I think it in that way. Um, and I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, um, in this very exemplary work you've been doing for so long with um, working very closely with communities and interacting with them in the preservation of their art, I wonder if um, it isn't a challenge sometimes trying to convince people that stabilizing is enough and that there shouldn't be a restoration or an augmentation of, of damaged wall paintings. I'm thinking particularly of... Uh, paintings and spaces. And I know there were some debates about work that was done in Mustang with some people outraged by restoration. Others felt that the restoration should be more complete. Is that something that you've had to negotiate with the communities, convincing them that stabilizing is good enough? This is why, it's a great question, thank you. But this is why I always start with documentation. Before there's a discussion about goal or process, we start with documentation to document exactly what remains before any step is, is gone to further in any direction. So the best approach is to start with documentation. And that process in itself brings an added sense of value to what's there. Uh, that process of documentation in itself, which I teach uh, in such a way that everyone can do it on their own smartphone, even if their own smartphone isn't that smart. All <laughs> smartphones these days are quite capable of, of um, documentation to such an extent that, for example, 
it has a legal proof of ownership. And besides that, the uh, capability of documentation for most people uh, is already there because they document their noodle meat, their noodle dinner and send it the description to their friend. So, and uh, it's documentation is easy to do on your own device. And that's where I start always because the process of documentation in itself brings an added sense of value to what you're documenting. And where you go from there often depends on the head of the lineage or the head of the monastery. And so those are that's those two are my entry point into that discussion. Thank you. Uh, this question is uh, for mostly the uh, Nepali speakers. I'm curious to know your opinion. Um, I saw um, a lot of the images of the iconography, the statues, that they're located in museums, not in Nepal. The Rubin Museum, the Met Museum. I've also personally witnessed a lot of Himalayan priceless artifacts in museums in the United States. I'm curious um, how you think of that and like, um, are you in favor of the returning of priceless Nepali artifacts to Nepal? Or is there some value in them remaining in a museum? In the words of Indiana Jones, they belong in a museum. How do you feel about that? Very, very interesting question. And this is a question that is uh, going on for quite some time. It's a big debate. Uh, it can be looked at from not just two perspectives of yes and no. It can be looked at from multiple, multiple perspectives. So um, I believe that sacred objects, those objects that were being worshipped, uh, they, if the community, uh, the, the rules and regulations, the policies that Nepal have is that uh, if the community, they, it gives the total authority to the community, whether they want the objects back. So, and when they want the objects back, do they want to leave it in the National Museum? Because there are many objects which are coming back and um, because they are reported to have been stolen and then they're they are being repatriated. And then the government puts them at the National Museum or the Patan Museum. And uh, then from there, the communities, they, get, uh, they, have, uh, they are allowed to claim for their objects uh, through, there's a process. And if they do not want it back, they can have it remaining in the museum. So uh, I think the whole uh, the whole talk starts with uh, the policies in Nepal. You know what, uh, which gives the total authority to the, to the community. So I believe for those uh, communities who want their objects back, uh, and then uh, when they take them, when they claim them from the National Museum here, they have to provide some kind of um, guarantee that it will not be stolen again. Of course, uh, you know, they can provide a guarantee, but you never know what happens in the future. Uh, disrespective of that, when they provide that guarantee, they can take them back. So I believe that those objects with the community feels that they can safeguard and they use for their ritual purposes, they should definitely be repatriated back. But for those objects, maybe which the communities they feel that you know uh, they already have a replacement. They have no requirement because uh, probably the, sometimes they feel the sacredness or, uh, of that object is lost. And uh, for, for various reasons, sometimes uh, there are even cases where um, the community who, who used to worship that image have dissolved over time. You know, this is a period of 50 and 70 years or even more, so have dissolved. Then then also we don't know what to do with the objects. So in those cases, I think if the community is uh, not very strong on having it uh, taken back to their original spaces, then I think it can also remain in international museums from my perspective. Because uh, at international museums, the, the, the debate of museums and their uh, relevance uh, at present times is, is a very big topic. Uh, because of not only Nepali objects, but objects globally also. So uh, 
as I mentioned, there can be multiple, multiple ways of discussing this. But uh, since uh, uh, museums were, were set up uh, for knowledge sharing, right? Uh, so um, for, the, for everybody who ever comes to museums to gain knowledge about uh, the cultures of various parts of the world, et cetera, or different objects in the museums, then uh, those objects, I believe, can stay and then uh, we can get, then people from various places can get to know about those objects. So they also, so somebody can, like, let's say the Met Museum, when they see an object there, then they can uh, realize that, oh, such kinds of beautiful artworks also, you know, are made in Nepal. That's my take, but there can be numerous people who have different, different versions on that. So I can also add something on it. I can also give my own view. Uh, for me, I think uh, those art particularly can be connected with some local people or maybe, you know, connected with the communities. But I think it's a world heritage. It belongs to everyone. So when we have, you know, those images, I mean, the, the, the problem that we had uh, in our past, and maybe because of that, you know, these very important deities were uh, getting his, getting their, their, their position in different museums. Uh, how do they fly? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is not has to happen. But, uh, but um, once they were staying there and the people get to know about the um, different art and uh, different forms of art that uh, the Nepalese and other countries, you know, they, they have that ability to work on, uh, work with their, with, with their hands or the handicrafts or maybe the art in, in general. So I think uh, it's a good idea to getting it back, back but I think uh, there there need to have a, some sort of guarantees as uh, Sostiji has just mentioned, you know. If there is no such um, guarantee to not being stolen again, then it's better to stay in the museums. At least they have a very good, uh, you know, the, the way of uh, preserving, or maybe we can say, uh, have a good take, taking care of those uh, masterpieces. So I think uh, uh, in both the way, I think uh, it's, it's good for me at least uh, 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 all people all around the world, they know about the art. So this is what I believe. More questions? Good. Yeah. Hello, hello. Uh, this is for Sakyaji. Uh, I can see like two different origin of the Pad Padmapani, one uh, with so, uh, Amitabha statue in the top, one without. So some argues without uh, Amitabha is incomplete mm -hmm. and some argues it's fine. Mm -hmm. So what do you prefer? Like with your research <laughs> <Okay>. base? <laughs> yeah, as uh, uh, the end says, everything is the perceptions. <laughs> <laughs> No, but uh, seriously, uh, Padmapani is, uh, with its etymology, we can be very sure that uh, Padmapani is the Padma bearer. So Padma is the lotus and Pani is the hand, you know, with its etymology. So uh, any Avalokiteshwaras who is uh, holding the lotus um, in his hand could be called the Padmapani as like uh, Bajradhara is also, Bajra, uh, I mean, the Bajrapani, Bajrasattu is Bajrapani. And there are some uh, texts which say there are, there are hundreds of Bajrapanis. There are hundreds of Bajrapanis and hundreds of Bajradharas. So in that sense, uh, it's a perception, again. <laughs> but in, in my understanding, you know, there is some sadhanas, they were saying, when the Padmapani, he has uh, Amitabha Buddha in his crown, then he must be of red color. But if he is not, if the uh, aphesi of a uh, uh, Padma pen is not in his crown, then he can be presented in a white collar. So that could be the difference, but I think uh, in both the cases, he is none other than the Padma Pani. So I believe it in that way. Okay, one more question to end on or end. <laughs> uh, I, uh, how do you see uh, within this Himalayan community or Himalayan monastery, uh, do they prefer to 
make like new art instead of, uh, I mean, like erasing the old paintings and applying the new arts. So I feel like in this Himalayan and community or in monastery, and they are like kind of erasing this historical evidence, you know, because uh, since uh, Himalayan and this monastery, they are not too interested in history. So what do you think about erasing the old paintings and instead they're making the new one? Because in Tibet, uh, <clears throat> around 8th, 9th, 10th century, many Newar artists, they made uh, paintings and all the Newar paintings been erased and they make a uh, new. So the, all the historical evidence been erased. So still these are going in the Himalayan community. So what do we think about? Should they preserve the old painting or it's better or? I mean, like my question was not too clear, but. <laughs> I think it goes in cycles from what I've seen. Uh, I mean, traditionally, for example, if a, a tanka, which of course was meant to illustrate texts, which most people could not read, so they got their visualization, inspiration, and iconographic information from paintings and statues. So if a tanka became obscured um, visually by butter lamp, grease, and incense grit mixed together, made darker or damaged by rolling, then a tanka painter would be called in to create a new one with a similar iconography. And therefore, therefore, the tradition of copying exists very firmly in terms of iconography. And that's why certain tanka and statues you see again and again and again, because um, they're in active use, they have a purpose. And so it's the difference a little bit between the purpose and um, the aesthetics. Uh, and more recently, there have been uh, heads of monasteries and heads of lineages who are being more firm about not destroying the originals because they um, recognize the existence of blessings in them. The great teachers of certain generation have, are dying or have just recently died, and they came to this and they bless, they did ceremonies within it. And so there's a responsibility to maintain um, the, the paintings, the wall paintings, et cetera, as part of their heritage for future generations. But that is not saying that um, new ones can't be created in terms um, in the traditional manner of being copied. But so in other words, Destruction is not necessary to be within the tradition to, rec to copy the originals and have that iconography fresh and visible for future generations. So there isn't one answer. I think that there are a few answers and I hope that I've been able to give you uh, some reflection on your question. 